like this, so I gotta fix it. <laughs> People get excited, think they're getting popcorn. Hello? Is that better now? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, good morning. All right, now you can hear me. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the crossings again and let you know that we are uh, extremely glad that you're here today. Um, you know, I, first service I was talking about uh, the fact that uh, growing up a preacher's kid, uh, you know, you get a rep, right? Preacher's kids have a reputation all over the place, and the reputation is definitely not a good one, right? You know, when you think about, P, they call them PKs, preacher's kids, uh, they're, they're trouble usually. And uh, I was really fortunate growing up to grow up in the family that I did and also in the kind of church I did. And the reason I say that is I grew up with a lot of friends who were also preacher's kids. You know, you'd run into each other at conferences and youth rallies and stuff like that. And it's sad to say, but a lot of those kids that I met growing up who were preacher's kids, they are no longer really interested in God whatsoever and, and church very much. And I think the reason for that is, is that maybe they just had never experienced church the way that God intended church to be experienced. And uh, I feel very fortunate because of the fact that I get to be excited about being at church every Sunday. When I, whether it's me being here at, uh, at, in Wentzville or going to one of our church plants, when I think about going and being a part of a service with this church, it's exciting because what I've got to experience is how God changes lives. And for so many people in so many churches, they've went to church and they've never really gotten to see how God can take a life, maybe that's been beaten up or broken or shattered or hurt or bruised or whatever it might be, and see God grab a hold of that life and say, you know what, we can take care of all that and bring it to something beautiful and something that people had always dreamed of having. And I think part of the reason I'm so excited and the, the reasons that uh, I've stuck it out as a PK is because I love what God does through his church. And so getting to be here and, and, and speak with you all and interact and worship with you guys is there's nowhere else I would rather be because I know what God can do and what he has done. And so that's the kind of church that you're a part of. Uh, if a PK can make it through it, then I promise you there is something good that you can find here. Uh, and at the crossings, one of the things that we like to do when someone makes the decision that they are going to surrender their lives to God, when they're baptized into him, the Bible says that their old life is done away with and that they're raised to a new life. We, ex we want to be excited about that and celebrate it because that is a life-changing moment where everything is changed. Uh, and so we like to announce that on uh, Sunday mornings and let you know who your new baby brother or sister is. And also we like to give them this book. And the reason that we give them this book is because it allows for people in their small group to, to go through this with them and make sure they're getting a very solid foundation in their new relationship with God. And so what they do is they sit down, they go through this, and they learn and grow from it. So this, uh, this, this, this service, uh, Drew, Drew, where are you at? Come on up, Drew. <laughs> Drew Patterson. Uh, Ryan and I got a chance to study with Drew. He's acting like he's embarrassed, but he's really not. He's kind of a ham once you get to know him. Uh, <laughs> Drew, here's your book. Welcome to the family, man. Proud of you. Oh, I bet your book all that, man. <laughs> hey, Drew, I bent that book because of your request right before services. You know what I'm talking about. You know. Uh, oh, we have another one, too. All right, that's awesome. All right, Jesse. Where's Jesse at? Jesse Branham. Welcome to the family, bro. Thank you. Love you guys. I'm glad you're here. Looking uh, forward to the ride with you guys. Definitely, man. And uh, Craig, and I don't know who all studied with him. Craig studied with Jesse. And, uh, you know, it really is a testament, again, like I was saying about the church. If you, if you know uh, what's gone on in, in people's lives before they have a relationship with God or the things that they're going through, um, and to see a church family envelop them and love them and to see them start a new relationship with God, it's extremely exciting. And so we're, we're glad that our, our baby brothers and sisters are here, and we hope that uh, maybe if you're visiting with us today that you get to see maybe something a little, little different than you've seen before, because we really do believe God is doing some great things in and through uh, the people at the crossings. So we're, we're excited. So right now we're in a sermon series uh, that's based on uh, the book of Revelation. And usually when people think about the book of Revelation, they think of all the crazy, all the crazy uh, verbiage and the, and the prophecies and things like that. But there's so actually some really good practical things in that book. And uh, the book of Revelation, God talks specifically to seven churches. And, you know, Craig, or, I mean, uh, Chris read that reading for us earlier about what he says to some of those churches. Specifically, uh, the section that Chris was reading was to a church in Laodicea. 
And when you first start that paragraph and you read it and you say, this is to the church in Laodicea, uh, you're, it's easy to look and say, okay, well, maybe I could disregard that. But one of the things that we believe at the crossings is that the Bible is written not just for us to have some, some ancient book that, you know, yeah, you know, I have to read it, but it was written so that our lives could be changed through it. If you read the Word of God and you don't get something from it, if you just read it and, and you set it down and you never apply anything or you never learn any lessons from it or try to figure out how it fits into your life, you are really missing out. Because the Bible said that God intended the Word of God to be used for our learning and for our benefit. So even though you read a passage like that and it says to the church in Laodicea, don't be mistaken and think that there aren't lessons that you have to learn from that and that there aren't lessons that the Crossings Church has to learn from that. As a matter of fact, at the end of that in Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 22, the end of that paragraph, it says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So what all of us need to come to the understanding is, yeah, this was written specifically maybe this issue to address something going on in the Laodicean church. It was also written so that we could learn from it. Because if you haven't noticed this by now, not a lot has changed in history, right? That's why history tends to repeat itself. You heard, you've heard people say that, right? To be honest, that's because people tend to repeat the same behaviors over and over again. You can see that as you look at history we make the, sum, the same dumb mistakes, right, over and over and over again. You probably see that in your own life, right? You look back and you're like, man, you think I would have learned from my history, but here I am making the same stupid decision that I made six months or a year or two years ago. But people tend to be the same, and that's the, one of the incredible things about the Word of God is it doesn't matter if it was written 2,000 years ago like the New Testament or it doesn't matter if it was written like the Old Testament and much older than that. There are things that we can learn from it. And the Bible is, it's, a, it's like a living document that changes and grows with us. And when you read it, there is a lesson to be learned for you in there. If you come to church at the crossings on a Sunday, and there isn't something that you can take and apply to your life, that you can take and say, I, you know what, I can do something with this, we have failed as a church, I believe, in giving you what, what you should be getting at church, what you should be getting on a Sunday. See, you should be able to walk out those doors more prepared to hit life and to, to go through life and to deal with the things that you have to deal with and to help other people than when you walked into these doors. And, and if church is just a place where we go to sit and be appeased and leave so that we feel better about ourselves, if that's what church has become for you, that's, to be honest, that's sad. And I want to let you know, that is not this kind of church. All right, that's not what we're about. It's not what we ever want to be about. Because churches, what happens when we become those kind of churches is churches die. You know, 80% plus of church plants, they start out with a bang and great things happen. And then things fade and then they die out. And if you've been around churches very long, you've probably seen this. You've probably seen a church that was once doing great and incredible things. And you look and you're like, wow, what a place to be. And then 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, you look and you're like, what happened to that church? They used to be on fire. They used to be reaching people. They used to be helping people. They used to be changing lives and showing people that God is a way to find a different life. And now nothing's going on. Well, the reason for that is because churches can lose their fire. Churches can go from being a place that's really hot to a place that's really cold. They can go from a place that has a, co a cool, soothing drink for someone to becoming, like this passage says, very lukewarm. And when that happens, it's devastating, it's depressing, and I've seen it happen many times. But the, the thing that we need to come to the understanding is it's easy to point our fingers at a church, right? It's easy to, to look at a church and be like, well, that whole church did this. But what we need to understand is that churches lose their fire because individuals lose their fire. See, if the Crossings Church, if the, if the lights ever go out in this place, it will be because the individual members of the Crossings Church were not being what they needed to be. They weren't answering God's call. They weren't making sure that they were doing whatever it took necessary personally to stay on fire for God. See, every person who has the, a, a fire burning within them for God is also in danger of that fire going out. Now, you, you may have heard otherwise, but when you read God's word, it's actually very clear over and over again that that's the case. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy to remind him that he had to keep burning the fire. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul tells Timothy this, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. See, if you've ever built a bonfire before, if you have a fireplace in your house, we all understand that you cannot build a fire one time, put the logs on, light them, and let it be, right? 
That is just not the way things work. If you don't do something to that fire, if you don't put more, more fuel on it, you don't put more wood on it, if you don't stoke it, if you're not willing to move around and do the work that it takes necessary, that flame will die out. And there's nothing, you know, in, in, in our spiritual lives, in our relationship with God, that same thing is the case. Paul's telling Timothy here, look, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are stoking or you are fanning the flames, right? You probably had to do that before you get down and you're like, you know, you're getting all sweaty because you're trying to fan the flame to make it bigger so that it catches. Paul says, listen, Timothy, this is your responsibility. You need to stoke it. You need to fan that flame. Churches die and the lights go out and the fire goes out and they go from hot to cold because individual people in those churches grow cold. And uh, in the Thessalonian church, uh, Paul writes to them, and he also warns them about putting out the fire. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, he says, listen, don't put out the Spirit's fire. But the sad thing is, is that in too, ma- too many times in too many churches, individual members of churches allow their fires to go out or put their fires out, and that's why you see that take place in a, in a, in a church-wide environment. Because individuals are not handling their relationship with God the way that they should. And so what we want to do today is we want to look at this and ask ourselves, okay, what, what can I do to make sure that that doesn't happen to me? See, when, whenever they write this to the church in Laodicea, they want to make sure they clearly understand what they say is taking place. And the church in Laodicea would understand this language much better than what we would. When you read this and you're like, it sounds kind of strange, you know, he says, uh, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, it makes me want to spit you out or vomit you out of my mouth, right? You look at that and you're like, man, that's, that, that, it, it kind of makes sense for us, but not really the way it did for them. Because, see, Laodicea was a town that it was actually kind of ahead of its time. The town was here. And they needed water for the town to function correctly. So what they did was they built an aqueduct system. And the cool thing about their area, they were lucky because they were close to the mountains to where, you know, if you needed a cool, refreshing drink, you know, you see in the commercials, right, this beautiful spring coming out of the mountains and it's all cold and people take a drink of it. And it just looks, you know, you're like, man, I want to go get some of that water, right? Well, what they did was is they built an aqueduct system from the mountains to the city, But the problem was, by the time that that nice, cool, refreshing water got into Laodicea, it wasn't cool and refreshing anymore because it had come through the system seven miles. And by the time it got there, it wasn't cool and refreshing anymore. It was warm. It was, you know, it was just kind of blah. You know, it's like you take a drink of that drink of water and you're like, I, I need to put some ice in that or something. That's the way it was for them. So they understood this idea, but also they had an aqueduct system that also came from hot springs. But guess what? By the time it went through the aqueduct system and made it into the city of Laodicea, it was no longer hot anymore. And so he, and he's appealing to them, trying to teach them and saying, listen, this is what has happened in this church. You know, this church, it should be like a cool, refreshing stream to the world around it. You know, to where when the world comes into contact with this church and, and it sees your relationship, with it, it's like, man, it's like taking that, that cold drink on a hot day. To where God's able to look and say, man, you, 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 this is what a relationship with God should feel like. You know, that refreshment that you feel when that, when that hits your lips. And he says, but you're not. You're lukewarm. It's like you came from a hot, a hot run and you take a drink and you're like, oh, come on. Why isn't this cold? That would have been so good. That's what's happened to this church. And then he says, on the other hand, you should be hot. You should be on, on fire and passionate in your relationship with me. But that's not what's happened at all. It's kind of like that, that, lu- that lukewarm bite of food that you take. You're like, man, uh, uh, that, you know, you go through a drive through right? We get upset when the food's not, not right. It just kind of takes room temperature. And you're like, well, that wasn't near as good as I expected to be. He's like, that's the way you are as a church. That's the way you are in your relationship with God. You're not, you're not cold and refreshing. You're not hot the way that you should be. You're just kind of stagnant and stale and ugh. You know, and, and he says, if I, you need to be one or the other. I wish you were one or the other. I just wish you weren't lukewarm. And so in our relationship with God, we have to start looking and saying, where do I really stand? Am I someone who is really committed in my relationship with God in a way that it affects the temperature of my life? Or am I someone who's become complacent and stagnant and stale in my relationship with God to where I'm really not refreshing anyone? I'm not lighting anyone on fire. I'm just kind of here. And and as individual members of the Crossing Church, we need to ask ourselves those questions because I never want to see the day that we as a church become a place to where people aren't refreshed or caught on fire when they come here. If that ever happens, it will be a depressing day, and that will start by each one of us individually asking ourselves some questions that say, where do I stand in, in my temperature, in my relationship with God, and how can I recognize complacency or lukewarmness in my life? Well, here are some ways. First of all, if you want to recognize or see complacency in your life, you need to see this. 
When I'm complacent, I rely on my own opinion. You notice in that passage where he comes to him, he says, listen, you're, you're, you're lukewarm, you're not hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And then he says, but you say, I'm rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And he goes into this thing. But the key words for this is the, the first two. He says, listen, you say. In our relationship with God so many times, we don't care what God's opinion is about where we stand in relationship to him. What we really care about is our own opinions and what we think about things. And so we look at our relationship with God and we're like, and he he says, look, you say you think you're just fine, but you're really not. And when I'm complacent, what I do is I rely on my own opinion of my relationship with God rather than relying on God's opinion of where I stand. See, when I'm complacent, I rely on my opinion, but when I'm committed, I rely on God's opinion. He goes on down later to say, see, you don't realize I counsel you to buy salves so you can see. He says, you don't have a clear vision of where you really stand. See, we can see this pretty clearly with other people, right? There are people in our lives who we look at them and we're like, man, that person is a mess, right? And to everyone from the outside looking in at this life, everybody says the, sees the same thing. You're like, that person is so messed up, right? But when you talk to that friend or that person, they, they just think everything's hunky-dory, that it's all good. And, and they're like, well, I see it this way. And you're like, yeah, but everyone else in the world sees this. And the reason that they can't see that is we're not very good at seeing, about seeing our own reality and where we really stand. You know, that happens in good ways and bad ways, right? Some really bad's going on, and we look at it, and we think it's not that big a deal, you know? Or, or people have really good character traits, right? And you hear them beat themselves up all the time, and you're like, how can that person not see themselves the way that I see them or the way everybody else sees them? It's frustrating, but that's because we don't do a good job of examining ourselves. We rely on our own opinion. And if we're going to become people who are, if we're, if we're going to be people who are committed, we have to rely on God's vision of us, not our own. That will cause us to be complacent. So there's a scale on there for you uh, of one to 10, how well you do at this. One, you value your personal opinion about where you stand. Uh, and, you know, that's what you care about. 10 being, no, I really do care about God's opinion. And you can rate yourself on there and you're going to start seeing as we go down through these kind of where you stand, whether or not you're really complacent or you're really committed. The second thing is, is that when I'm complacent, I focus on the material, on the things. You know, he he says, you say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. It is so easy for us to do this in, in our lives. We want to gauge how well our lives are going based off of the things that we have. That's why people work so hard to have the nice car, the nice house, the nice, you know, the nice job to provide for their kids so they can wear the nice clothes so they don't get made fun of at school. So they, and you fill in the blank and we look at all these things that we acquire and all these things that we gather and all these things we have and we're like, man, my life's pretty good. And we care about those things, but we neglect the spiritual things. See, when complacent, I focus on the material, but when I'm committed, I focus on the spiritual. You know, he goes on down to say, he tells him, I said, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in fire and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, nakedness and salve so you can see. And these are all spiritual things he's talking about. He's not talking about physical clothes. He's saying, listen, you think you're good because you have all these material things that you've gathered, but really, you're, you're not, you're a mess. You see, whenever we first planted a church, I grew up over in Alton. And over in Alton, it's a much different area than over here in St. Charles County. You know, it's, it's, it's not nearly as well off. And it's very clear to see, you know, that people don't have as much. So when we came over here, at first it was a little weird because I was like, man, all these people look like they have it all together. But the longer that I live here, the more I found out is all the material possessions they had didn't change their spiritual well-being at all. It, it, it may have made it easier for them to cover things up and look good for just a little bit longer, but at the core of what was going on, spiritually, they were just as cold and lukewarm and dead as in, inside of somebody who doesn't have all the material things to cover it up. See, <clears throat> we focus on, on those material things thinking somehow that is a reflection upon how we stand in a relationship with God. And you can watch TV and you get that idea from these, these preachers, right, on TV. They're like, oh, yeah, just ask God for this and he'll give you that and he'll give you a new car and a new house. And you see them living in their million-dollar mansions and then the next thing you know, their ministry falls apart because they get caught up in sin because they were so focused on the material possessions that they had and not focused on the spiritual. And when I'm complacent, I focus on material, but when I'm committed, I focus on what the spiritual things are. So there's another rating there for you. Uh, what are you focused on? Physical acquisitions and the things you can get or spiritual treasures on a 10? 
The next thing, if, if I want to know, is when I'm complacent, I am self-sufficient. You know, he tells them, he says, look at you, you say, I don't need a thing. You think that you've got it all together. And we live in a society that tells us this, right? That makes us very self-sufficient. You can't rely on anybody else. You got to do it yourself. Pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps. You're going to be fine. You need to, you need to do this on your own. You're self-sufficient. And we, and we build that up and we think that's the way that we're supposed to live. And God looks at me and he's like, this is totally opposite of how you want to have a relationship with me. If you want to be complacent and become stagnant and not make it in your relationship with God, that's what you should do. You should think that you're, all, you're in this all on your own and that you're completely self-sufficient. You can do it by yourself, but that's not the way that it really works. You see, when I'm complacent, I'm self-sufficient, but when I'm committed, I'm Christ-dependent. You know, he tells them, I counsel you to buy from me these things so that you can be better off. But when it comes to our relationship with God, we're working so hard to make sure we're doing all the right things and doing it on our own that we forget that the things that we truly actually need for our lives to be different and better, they are never going to be found in, in your desire and your fight and your work to make your life better. It's only going to be found in Christ. You have to be dependent upon him if you want your life to be different. There are lots of people out there who are self-sufficient physically who are miserable spiritually. And, and we've got to start understanding those things are not connected. You, you have to be willing to depend on God, to depend on his word, to depend on his people, if you're going to be able to make it spiritually. So where do you stand? Do you view yourself as someone who wants to be self-sufficient in your relationship with God, or are you Christ-dependent to where you realize you are not going to do this on your own? If you're anything like the members of our church, I think you'll learn to be Christ-dependent because to, the members of our church, we have fallen on our faces so many times trying to do things on our own that we finally come to the realization, I can't do this. Like, I am not going to make it. We screwed up. We messed up. We made bad decisions. We've had addictions, habits, hang-ups. We've tried to deal with our past and the hurts and the abuse and the things we faced. We tried to deal with all those things on our own and it didn't work. And our lives suck because of it. And God says, listen, here's the deal. It can be better, but you're going to have to depend upon me in order to find what you're looking for. So where do you stand? Are you self-sufficient or, or Christ-dependent? And then finally, when I'm complacent, I view Christ as an outsider, not as an insider. And, and you look at that passage, he says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. Now, this passage is taken out of context all the time because usually if you hear someone quote this passage, what they're telling you is that they're, they're going to quote this to you and then they're going to tell you you need to invite Jesus into your heart to be saved. That's what they're going to tell you. But the, there's a real huge issue with using this passage to do that. And that is, who is this written to? It's written to the church in Laodicea. And what is the church made up of? Is it made up of people who have Christ on the inside or the outside? So what is it supposed to be? On the inside. This is written to people who are already Christians. This is not a prescription on how to be saved. And anybody who tries to teach you any different needs to look at who this is written to. It's our, these people are Christians. But the problem is they become complacent. And the reason that they've become complacent is that rather than seeing God as something that should be dwelling within them is they want God on the outside of the door. And he's like, listen, you're so complacent. I'm on the outside of your house and I'm knocking on it trying to get in. And see, we've done this before, right? You know, friends are coming over and you know the house is a mess and you don't want anybody in the house so you like creak the door open and you're like, yes, can I help you, right? You don't want anybody seeing what's going on inside your house, right? Same reason we push God outside of it because we, want, we don't want him in there dealing with our stuff. We don't want him seeing how bad it's gotten and so we shove him outside of the door and he's like, yo, I'm right here waiting on you. Let me in this house so that I can help you fix the issues but we're viewing Christ as an outsider because we become complacent. But committed people, they view Christ as the owner. You see, you've got to ask yourself, if you, where are you standing in your life? Is Christ on the outside or is he the owner of everything that you have? If you're a disciple, if you're a Christian, if you're someone who has made that decision, when you're baptized into Christ, the Bible says that you're dying to yourself and you're being raised to a new life. And that new life is no longer your own life. You have given up control, you have surrendered it, you have taken yourself off of the throne of your life, and you have put Christ on that throne, and he is the owner of your life. And see, a lot of times when we've gotten complacent, if, you're, if we're really honest about where we stand, what we'll see is we've pushed Christ out of the house, we've taken him off of the throne, and we've taken control of our lives back over, and we, don't know, we no longer look to him to help make decisions, you know, when, whenever Christ is the owner of your life, you realize that means it affects every single aspect of everything you do. 
Every decision you make, the purchases you make, the people you're going to date, the people you marry, the people you're going to hang out with, everything that you do should be impacted by the fact that you are not the owner of your life anymore if you've decided to give your life to God. That's what that means. And when we take control of those things back, we become complacent, we become stagnant, and we become useless to be able to help anyone else have, a, have the kind of life that God longs for them to have. And so here is God, and he's begging these people at this church to realize that they've become complacent, that their focus has been on the wrong things, and he is trying to help them replace their complacency and show them what commitment looks like. And in our lives, that's what we need to be doing as well. We need to be saying, okay, what can I do to go from complacent to committed? Well, here's how we do that. This is how you can replace complacency with commitment. First of all, by acknowledging God's authority. You know, Revelation 3, verse 14, that first verse that we read, it says, um, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message, and then here's what it says. From the one who is the amen, the final word, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. The ruler of God's creation is what that actually translates. And he says, listen, this this letter that's being written to the church, this comes from the top, right? You know, know, with kids, sometimes you'll tell your kids, hey, like I told my my daughter, my little son, I told him, Lincoln, go upstairs and wake Jackson up. And I hear Lincoln go upstairs, right? And I hear him trying to get him up and he comes downstairs, Jackson's not with him. And I'm like, where's Jackson at? He won't get up. Why won't he get up? He just, he just wouldn't get out of bed. Go up there and tell Jackson right now his dad said he better get his butt out of that bed before I have to come up there and get him out of that bed. And then all of a sudden, Lincoln's statement goes from Lincoln being the one, right, to dad's like, you're going to be in trouble if you don't do it. There's more authority behind it whenever I said it. Well, that's what they're doing in this passage. He's saying, listen, this is coming from the top. You do, you need, to, you need to listen to what's being said because God is the one who is supposed to have authority in your life. And if I want to go some, from someone who's complacent to someone who's committed, I need to realize who the boss is. I am not the boss. I am not the master. I'm not the Lord. I'm not the one in control anymore. And whenever, whenever I turn that control or that authority back to God where it belongs, I'm going to start dragging myself out of this dead spot in my relationship with God back to a place of passion and fire and, and help and, and benefit to other people and to God's kingdom. But I have got to remember where the authority lies. You know, one of the things we do when we sit down, we study the Bible with people, the crossings, we we do a whole study on how God's word is an authoritative thing in our lives, about how God's word, it's not about what people say, but what God's word says, the decisions we make, the things we do, the way we live our lives, it's all controlled by God. And one of the greatest keys we have is his word. When you come to church on a Sunday and you're listening to preaching and you're reading the scriptures, that, that, those scriptures you're reading, they are meant to be the guidelines, the authority by which you live your life. And if it's not, then don't be surprised by the fact that you feel stale and stagnant and, and blech, in your relationship with God because you've forgotten who is in control. And I can replace, commi- uh, you know, I can replace my complacency with commitment when I realize who is in control and who's the boss is. Second of all, I I can replace complacency with commitment by accepting God's assessment. You see, he tells him, he says, I know your deeds. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. See, none of us like to be told by anyone else what we're not doing right or what we should be doing that we're not doing, right? Even if we know it ourselves, right? There are times in my life where I can tell you I've done that, where I know I'm not doing something I should be or I'm doing something I shouldn't be and someone else comes to say it to me and even though I know it's right, the first thing that happens, my pride goes up, my defenses come up and I start getting upset and I get angry and I refuse to accept their assessment even if it's clearly right because that's just who we are as people sometimes. And if we want to go from complacency to committed, whenever God's word says something, we've got to be people who are willing to accept God's assessment of us. You know, there, there's nothing more frustrating when you're trying to help someone else and you're, t- and you're pointing these things out in their lives and they're upset and mad. And we get frustrated with those people when they do that, right? But then in turn, we do the same thing to God all the time. We're unwilling to hear what he has to say about what needs to be taking place in our lives. So when he comes to us and he says, listen, you're lukewarm. I wish you were one or the other, but I wish you were hot or cold, but you're not. You're just kind of here. 
It's very easy. It would have been easy for the church in Laodicea to be like, I can't believe you said that, and to get, up with, get upset with the writer. But if they realize who the authority is that's writing this letter, where it's coming from, they would be willing to accept the assessment and say, you know what? Why would I sit here and argue with God about where I stand in my relationship with him? Doesn't he know better than I do? In Jeremiah 6, 14, Jesus is talking, or God is talking to his, about his people, and he says this, my people are broken, they're shattered, and they put on Band-Aids saying, it's so bad, it's not so bad, you'll be just fine, but things are not just fine. You know, we've actually had this passage in a few of our lessons over the past few months, and I think there's a reason for it. I think God is trying to get us to realize that there are times in our lives when things are just bad. We're broken, we're beaten up, there, there are things going on in our lives that shouldn't be. And God's like, this should be alarming to you. You need to, you need to accept my assessment of this because things are really bad. But what we tend to, you know, how dumb would we be if we went to the doctor and the doctor said, hey, listen, here's the deal, you've got this serious disease and you're gonna have to start treating it and you're gonna have to start doing something about it or you are going to die. How dumb would we be to go, eh, I'll be all right walk out the doors and never, never accept that assessment, never do anything with it because we just believe that we're going to be fine. And God says, listen, that's what you do with me all the time. I come to you and I say, hey, like that cut is bad. It's going to get infected and you're going to die. And you're like, no, I'll just rub some dirt on it and keep moving on. I'll be all right. And God's like, no, this is a big deal. This is going to destroy your relationship with me. It is going to keep you from thriving and surviving. You've got to do something about this. And we're like, eh, no, I'm good. How, how crazy would we be to do, to do that with a doctor, but even more crazy when it comes to our spiritual lives, when God says, this is where you're at for us to just ignore his assessment of us. See, if I'm gonna go from complacency to commitment, I have to realize he's in charge, he's in charge, he's the authority, he's the boss, and I have to accept his assessment when he tells me something and not argue and fight and bicker with him about it, but say, you know what, you know better than I do. The third thing that I have to do is I have to acquire God's attitude. You see, in, in Revelation 3.16, it says, you're stale. This is the message paraphrase. It says, you're stale, you're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. You know, in the other translation where we read, it says, listen, I want to spit you out of my mouth. When you go back to the original language, it's this idea of him spewing it out, right? Of getting rid of it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I know last service we had some gaggers in the crowd, so I'm going to apologize to you, you gag reflex people, right? But so one time we went on a trip, and we were at the campus ministry, and we were in Florida, and we were driving on these country roads back to this campground. And some of the campus we were shaking their heads because they were around back then. So we're driving down the road, and, and we're cruising, and all of a sudden I feel something warm all over my back. And I turn my head, and as soon as I turn my head, not only do I feel the warmth, but I smell it. And I'm like, ugh. And I look over at Hannah, who's sitting next to me, and you know Hannah has all this long hair covered in vomit all over the place. And I look back, and we have like, you know, the little uh, air vents right here that blow into the back. The whole like console, the air vents covered in vomit. And I look back there, and I'm sorry, Gabby. Gabby. Gabby's on our church plant at the Interbelt. But Gabby is sitting back there. She had just started coming around and hadn't been around very long. And she's sitting back there like this, so embarrassed. And inside, I just want to be like, why didn't you tell me you had to throw up? Right? And there was that inside of me that was like so upset. But I remember as soon as it hit, Hannah, the first thing, we're in a car full of girls. I was the only guy driving. First thing Hannah does is just rip her shirt off because it's just covered in vomit. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, this is so disgusting. And everybody in the car starts, you know, trying not to, but everybody's like, <laughs> you know. So we jump out of the car, like, taking clothes off. I'm in my boxer sitting in the car. We're wiping up the vomit with my shirt. And it's like, and I'm getting somewhere with this, I promise. But all of us are also, so it's like one of those things where, you know, like, if you've had kids, you probably understand this when they've had a bad diaper or throw up, right? You're like this. You're like, <laughs> you know, you're trying not to vomit because the, the response to it is just disgusting, right? And, and it's so hard to keep it. And I remember telling Gabby later, I'm like, Gabby, next time, just tell us, hey, I have to throw up and I'll pull over and you can do it in the ditch, not all over us, right? Because for months when I turned on my blower fan in the back, chunks flew out of me. Like, this is a bad thing. So, <laughs> like I said, I, I'm going somewhere with this. You know, like in the 80s, <laughs> you remember, you know, remember in the 80s, like gagging me with a spoon, right? That valley girl, like, ah, uh, girl, ew, right? You know that response that you have when you think, 
you realize that whenever it comes to our stagnation, when it comes to our complacency, what God is really saying in this passage is he's like, I'm looking at you and I'm going, <laughs> you know, he's like, I just want to spit you out because it's, this is not, it's gross. It's a lukewarm feeling. And, and, and what we need to understand is that same reaction that God would have to something that's stale or that's stagnant or that's lukewarm, that same reaction God would have is what he, that's the attitude that we should take towards our stagnation. But see, we come into church and we sit here and we leave and, and we, can, we can be lukewarm and complacent. But I've never seen anyone talking about how bad they feel about how bad their life is in their relationship with God. And they're like, I just feel, you know, like I feel hor- horrible about this. Like it just doesn't happen. But God says, listen, that's how seriously you should be taking this relationship with me. It should make you, it should make you nauseous when you're complacent. It should make you feel like you want to throw up whenever you're, you're stagnant in your relationship with me. I need to acquire God's attitude because he doesn't play. He takes sin and takes a relationship with him very seriously. So seriously that in Matthew 5, 13, he says this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose a part of your body than to have it all thrown into hell. And if your right hand leads you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Because it is better for you to lose a part of your body than to have all of it going to hell. And obviously, God is not meaning this literally because we'd be a bunch of one-eyed, one-handed people walking around this church, right? Because we've sinned plenty, right? We would have no body parts left in this church if it meant hack hack one off every time you did something wrong with it. You know, sorry, Jason. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's one of those things to to where... (laughs) <laughs> anyway, so like I was saying, God takes sin extremely seriously, right? God does not play when it comes to sin. And he says, listen, you should have that same exact attitude when it comes to sin and the seriousness to which you approach your relationship with me. That's how serious it is. You sin, you need to lop that body part off because it's better for you to, be, to survive spiritually in eternity than to be damned to hell because you weren't willing to deal with your relationship with me here on earth. That's how serious it is. And if we want to go from being people who are complacent to committed, we need to take our sin and our relationship with God that seriously to where it makes us nauseous when it isn't what it should be. So to replace complacency with commitment, I have to acknowledge God's authority. I have to accept God's assessment. I have to acquire God's attitude. And the fourth thing is I have to address my arrogance. I have to deal with the fact that I'm unwilling to listen to what God has to say. In Revelation 3, 17, it says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and don't need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You know, we are so arrogant because we look at the things that we, we, the things that we acquire and we're like, oh, I'm doing all right for myself. You know, this isn't so bad. I'm, I've, I've, I've amassed all this stuff. I'm good to go. And God's like, no, you're not. Your relationship with me is non-existent. You're wretched. You're like a naked person walking around thinking you're all good and you're not. And when I read this passage, I, I, I started thinking about my friend Marlon. And for those of you who don't know, Marlon and I grew up together. He knew what a relationship with God was. It was the end one. He walked away from his relationship with God, decided he wanted to sell drugs had all this stuff. And, and when we would talk on the phone, you know, I would always tell him, we only talked every few months during that period of his life because he knew when he talked to me what he was going to get. He was going to get a conversation that went something like this. Yeah, yeah, it's nice that you have all that stuff, but your relationship with God is non-existent. You're lost and you need to turn things around. But Marlon at the time was so arrogant that he couldn't hear any of that because he was too busy putting on huge additions to his house, having two Corvettes, having, uh, you know, exotic motorcycles, going on exotic trips because of all the money he was making for the d- drugs he was dealing. But guess what? God was looking at him and goes, you're, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're naked. And until the day Marlon was busted, he didn't see that. His arrogance had blinded him, but God took him down a notch and humbled him. And the sad thing is when it comes to our relationship with God so many times, what we do is we make God humble us rather than choosing it. We're we're so dumb. You know, you've been around people before. They're like, I guess I have to learn the hard way. That is not, you're not learning the hard way. You're learning the stupid way. That's how you're learning. Because God is going to make sure you learn the lesson. And it's much easier if we decide to be humble in our approach to him, get rid of our arrogance, and not make him destroy us 
for us to be able to hear what he has to say. But that's what happened with Marlon. And thank God Marlon had a good response and was finally humbled enough to respond to God and is baptizing people in prison now, which is awesome. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things to where it took something drastic. What is it going to take for us to, to address our arrogance and, and to stop thinking everything's fine when God says it's not and say, you know what, I need to do something about this. Proverbs 16, 18 says this. Pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. See, it's when we think we're doing real good that we're going to trip and we're going to fall flat on our face. And God says, you've got to deal with your pride, James 4.10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You know, he's saying, you know, if you want your life to be something good, you want it to be lifted up, you have to be willing to humble yourself, to lay down your pride and your arrogance. And you need to be willing to listen to what God says because he knows better than you do. You know, it's like God's got to be like those, that parent. You know, sometimes I have a, a senior in high school, a freshman, and I have a, a one about to go into third grade. And I look at him sometimes, and you'll tell him things as a parent that are very clear, you know, things. You're like, no, this is the way it is. Don't do that because this is what it will result in. But as teenagers, I was there too. We, we can be so prideful and arrogant. And rather than avoiding the pitfalls of life that are going to make us complacent, stagnant, and make us walk away from relationship with God, we're so arrogant we don't listen, and we just keep plowing right through the stuff. And, we're, and as a parent, I'm like, what are you doing? You know, you're like, don't do that. And, and we don't listen. I've, anybody who knows me knows that pride is a struggle of mine. I have to fight and, and, and deal with my pride all the time. And I'm telling you, there have been too many times in my life where if I would have just listened to God or just listened to God's people, I could have avoided heartache, and I could have avoided stupid mistakes that I've made, but I was too prideful to listen. And just like I have to deal with that and deal with my arrogance, all of us need to examine our lives and say, you know, what am I doing to address my arrogance? And then finally, if I want to go from complacent to committed, not only do I need to acknowledge God's authority, accept his assessment of me, take on his attitude towards that assessment, address and deal with my arrogance, I need to act on God's advice. I need to do something about it. You know, like I said before, it's very easy to go into churches on Sundays because churches teach this. Churches basically say all you have to do is have a, a head knowledge that God exists and think he's up there, and that's all you need to do. That's all there is to a relationship with God. That is not what the Word of God teaches whatsoever. And if you're going to a church that's teaching that, sit down with your Bible and open it up and look what it really has to say about that because that's not the case. God expects you to act in certain ways. He expects you to respond to him. Revelation 3.19 says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And, and, you know, this is right after he's hammered them for being lukewarm. And he says, listen, I'm doing this. I'm disciplining you because I love you and I want something good for you. Hey, Michael, can you, is that up there? All of it? Yeah, okay. You know, he says, those whom I love, I, re, I rebuke and discipline. He said, I'm hard on you because I love you and I care for you. But then he doesn't just stop there and say, but that's all there is to it. He goes on and says, so be earnest, be sincere, be real about this and Repent. See, God does call you to do something. Anyone who tells you that God does not call you to do something is not being honest with you. Repentance is something you have to choose to do in your relationship with God. You know, repentance is it's this idea, this military term, to where you're, you're marching in one direction. And today in our military, they would say like about face or something like that. And you would be marching one direction. And when you do an about face, when you repent, you turn the opposite direction of where you were headed and you walk the other way. It's a decision that you have to make. And I have to act upon God's advice. I can't come to church, hear a sermon, and listen to God's people and be like, okay, 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 okay. And then walk out the door and never do anything about it and expect myself to be committed and on fire for God. When, you, when we do that, it leads to stagnation and complacency. I have to be willing to do something with what God's word says. Revelation 3.18 again says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. See, again, he's, uh, he's, he's appealing to Laodicea because they were, they were famous because they had a salve in Laodicea that people would use to help with, with issues that they had and, and with seeing and things like that. So last week I did something real stupid. I'll tell you guys about it. So 
I was grilling at the house. We were getting ready to grill. I was having, we were having some campus people over. And so I was going to grill. And so I start to grill. And I have the, you know, the, the cheater uh, charcoal, right, where you light it and it just goes, you know, the match light or whatever. So I light it. And I was kind of surprised when I lit the charcoal because it was like, you know, like, and it was more so than what match light normally is. I was like, man, that was crazy. So I put the, you know, I get it out there and I walk away. I'm getting meat ready. And I turn around and I notice that the side of my house is sweating a little bit. So I'm like, okay, the grill's too close to the house. So I'm going to move it away. So I reach over and I, and I grab the grill, right? And I pull away. Well, when I do, I notice embers start falling out of the bottom of the grill, right? And that makes sense. So the match light is sitting next to the grill. So I grab the match light. I pick it up real quick and I'm, and I'm moving it. So, you know, I get it away from the house. I'm like, oh, good. So I turn to walk away and I still have the match light in my hand, not realizing that embers had already fallen into the match light bag. So when I turn, I hear a... And this ball of fire comes out of the thing, and it's literally in my face. And my eyes started stinging, and I, and I, so I drop it, I drop the bag, and I'm bent over, and my eyes are on fire. And I fully expected to have no eyebrows when I, you know, turn around. It hurt bad. And so I'm standing there like this, and Jackson is there, and he's like standing on the porch. I can hear him talking, and, and, but I'm just ignoring everything he's saying. And I'm just standing there like, because it's burning like fire. Well, literally like at my feet is a water hose, you know, and, and I can feel like the, 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 whatever it is, the lighter fluid, right, from the match light, I can feel it burning my eyes still, and it's like, my eyes are like, they were bloodshot for like an hour and a half, like, and I burn off, I didn't burn off my eyebrows, but I, my eyelashes are like less than half of what they used to be, so I'm not as pretty, <laughs> so I, that was a joke, <laughs> So anyway, so the water hose is right there. All I had to do in order to get the stuff out of my eyes was reach down and pick up the water hose and spray my eyes off. And Jackson's like, Dad, get the hose. Dad, use the hose. And I'm just standing here holding my face like, and and all I had to do was pick it up and wash it. So eventually I do, right? I wash my eyes out. I'm standing there just like in the yard and it starts to feel better. It starts to get better. But It wouldn't have gotten any better if I wouldn't have done something about it. I had to reach down and pick it up. And sometimes in our relationship with God, what we want to do is we want to say, hey, God, fix everything. He's like, there's the hose. I just put it there for you. Repent. Change. Do what I've asked you to do. And and we can start working on this together. But for whatever reason, we refuse to do it. We're like, well, I believe in you. Isn't that enough? And God's like, no, you have to do something with that belief. See, belief is, you know, faith is not just this intellectual belief that God is there. Faith is something that, that calls you or spurs you on to action. It calls you to do something. It's a belief that actually, that actually puts, goes to work in your life. That's what God expects from us. See, God calls them to a completely radical reshaping of their value system. He says, listen, you think you're all good with all the stuff that you have and all the stuff, but you're not. You need to start viewing things differently. You are lukewarm. I don't care what nice stuff you have. I don't care how good you think life is. In your relationship with me, in the areas that it really matters, you're not doing okay. And you need to reevaluate where you stand in your relationship with me. And he would give us that same call. He says, listen, it's time for you to stop viewing things and to reshape the way you think about a relationship with me and ask yourself some hard questions. Acts 3.19 says this in verse 20. Repent and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. If you do, times of spiritual strength will come from the Lord. Again, a lot of places will tell you all you have to do is believe in God and your sins are forgiven. Well, he says pretty clearly, he says, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins will be wiped away. See, God calls us to a relationship where we don't earn our grace. We don't earn grace. We don't earn the salvation. But God does expect us to do things. And he says right here clearly, repent and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. If you do this, that's conditional, right? Like if I tell my kids, if you clean your room, I'll take you to lunch, right? If they clean their room, I'm going to take them to lunch, right? If they don't clean their room, guess what? Put some chicken sticks in the oven, fish, you know, fish sticks, something like, because I'm not taking you anywhere. You didn't do what I asked. If you do this, times of spiritual strength will come from the Lord. He says, listen, when you respond to me in the right way, you deal with your complacency, deal with your stagnation, and be committed to me, I can give you a much better life than you ever expected. If you, if you look at your life and you're like, man, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I expected. This lesson, this passage in Revelation was designed for you. Because it was designed for you to look at your life and say, what, can, what, what does God want me to do in order to get things right with him so that I can have that life that I never thought I could have had? 
And God wants us to deal with our complacency. Each individual member of our church, we need to deal with our complacency. If the, if the Crossings Church is really going to be a place where the problems of life meet the power of God, like our little statement says, then we have to be dealing with ourselves on an individual level and being what we need to be. If you're a guest today and you're looking you're like, Man, I, don't, I don't really know much about this, this is a great opportunity for you to do something about that. In, in your bulletins, there's a card. It's called the Crossings Communication Card, and there's a place for your name and stuff like that. And there's a place for prayer requests, but there's also stuff like, I would like a personal Bible study. Maybe you're looking, you're like, I, this sounds like something I would want to be a part of, but I don't really know. I don't know much about the Bible. That's awesome. You know what? Most of our members didn't know a whole lot about the Bible themselves either when God got here so, or when, they, when God brought them here. So, you know, check out with like a personal Bible study. Maybe you look and you're like, man, I really want to do this, but I just haven't dealt with the hurts in my past at all, and I just don't know how to overcome those. Check you with like counseling. We have the wounded heart for helping people deal with hurts from sexual abuse. We have healing is a choice, which helps us deal with all kinds of hurts from our past. We have things like divorce care. We have all these ministries. They're all designed to help you work through these things so that you can move from a stagnant relationship with God to a in your life, in the lives of everyone around you. I don't know what you need to check or what you need to write today, but you do. And if you're honest and evaluate yourselves the way that God would, you'll know those things as well. In just a minute, our worship team is going to sing a song. And during that first song, that's just designed for you to be able to fill out that card. And during the second song, we're going to stand, we're going to pass the baskets for our members. We need your card and your contribution as that goes around. Like I told you, the card, because if our members aren't committed to being what they need to be, this church will never be what it should be. For your contribution for our members, we need to keep the ministry moving along at the crossings, and you've committed to doing that. For our guests, when that basket goes by, don't put any money in there because we don't want you to think that we got you here to get something from you today. That's not the case at all. Just put your card in there. Don't put any money in the basket. Just allow God a chance to, to bless your life and, and see what he does with it. All right? We're going to pray, and the, the worship team will give us a chance to fill out that card. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for being a God who really does love us. You long to be in relationship with us, God, and not a, a boring, stagnant, cold, lukewarm relationship, God, but one that is refreshing or one that is, God, healing in, in what it does. God, help us to be people who are hot for you. God, help us to be people who put you first above all else. Um, help us to, to be able to look into your word and to be able to see what you have to say about us, God, and to accept your assessment and take on your attitude towards it, not to be arrogant, God, but to be able to act on the things that you point out to us in your word and through your people. God, help us to allow our lives to be changed by listening to you. Uh, God, thank you for everything you've done uh, in our lives, God. Uh, help us have an awesome week. Uh, just thank you for everything, God. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.